Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, designed for you for any season. Whether you're there for business pleasure or just plain relaxing, there's something for everyone. The Arrowwood, located on beautiful Lake Darling, just outside of Alexandria, Minnesota. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station. Welcome back to the Lodge and another edition of Prairie Sportsman. Here's what we have for you this week. We'll introduce you to Nathan Thomas and his work with banding shorebirds. The Minnesota Walleye Trail Tournament will give us a look at some nice walleyes. And we'll take a look at some outdoor footage in our Prairie Sportsman viewer video. Stay tuned. Prairie Sportsman is coming up next. <laughs> The process of banding shorebirds is relatively unknown to most sportsmen. It's an extremely effective means of discovering what ordinary healthy wild birds do and where they go. Nathan Thomas gives us the inside information. On a rural Minnesota country road, a crew has gathered with some rather unusual looking equipment. Nathan Thomas, a University of South Dakota graduate student, explains. We're looking at uh, shorebirds today. We're actually capturing shorebirds, um, doing some radio tracking of birds that have been captured previously and had transmitters attached to them. Um, and what we're looking for is we're actually capturing the birds and getting some measurements of them and so that we can get a feel for stopover biology of shorebirds migrating through the mid-continent of the United States. 17.0. Today I actually have um, my wife, uh, Nasa, who's helping and has helped in past years uh, do, some, do some banding and tracking, as well as uh, we have a, a volunteer with us today, Scott, as well as other volunteers that kind of circulate through. Nathan heads up the crew that is here today, a day that starts pretty early in the morning. We normally meet at uh, Big Stone National Wildlife Refuge at about 4.30 and get our stuff loaded into the truck and we're on the road. Um, most the sites we've been banding at have been about 20 minutes or so, which puts us there just a little bit before 5. So by the time we walk out to the wetland itself and get the nets opened up, we were there right as it's just starting to get light, but well before sunrise. So the birds are starting to move and we band for different amounts of time in the morning. Depends on how many birds there are, how active they're being, that sort of thing. And then eventually we, we go ahead and we stop, stop for the morning and we do some radio tracking or, or maybe do some surveys a little bit during the afternoon hours. Sometimes take a little break just to kind of relax and not, not do a whole lot for a couple hours during the middle of the day, the heat of the day. And then we go on, in the evening we normally go out around sometime between three and five and we go out, get the nets opened up again, and band until normally about dark. We put the nets down as it's getting dark, so almost about probably quarter after nine, we start closing nets down. The nets that we're using are, are actually, they're mist nets. They're manufactured for the capture of birds. They come in different sizes, different lengths, different heights. Depends on the, the actual size of the birds that you're capturing as to, as to what you, uh, the size that you use. And the length that you use depends on the conditions you're banding in. So we're actually using uh, three meter tall nets that are nine meters long. And the mesh size is appropriate for the birds that we're banding. This job seems to be a little bit muddy. It's a very, very muddy, muddy job. Um, my clothing is 
McGlothing is muddy. It continues to be that way day after day. Uh, and it's definitely hot. Uh, we've had some, some good weather. Some, some days it's nice and some days it's scorching out here and you, you just sit in the sun either way. But it's, it's fun. Uh, I enjoy it and, and uh, a lot of other people actually enjoy tromping through the mud, but maybe not to this degree. <laughs> Soon after the nets are ready, the first bird is in the net. I don't know how long he's been in there, but you might want to get out there before he gets out of there. Nathan doesn't hesitate to quickly move out to the net, as quickly as possible through the mud. He carefully removes the bird, places it in a cloth carrying bag, and brings in the captured bird for a closer look. So tell me what this is. A semi-palmated plover. semi palm plovers have a yellow eye. Ring. Orange feet. This study and banding project is designed at looking at a few specific birds. Three birds specifically. Which is why they're called a semi-palmated plover. I'm looking for uh, leaf sandpipers, semi-palmated sandpipers, and pectoral sandpipers. Those are the three target species of my study. This is a pectoral sandpiper. He has a two-toned bill and a distinct band across, distinct line across his breast right here where it changes from brown to white. Uh, other common birds that, that are seen at, at sloughs and, and wetlands throughout the region are lesser and greater yellow legs, um, stilt sandpipers, killdeer, semi-palmated plovers. Uh, you can see Dunlin, Baird sandpipers, white rump sandpipers. It's actually uh, qu quite a number of them, as well as dowichers, both long-billed, short-billed dowichers, Wilson snipe. That's, that's pretty much the most common that you're, that you're gonna see throughout. Is, uh, 04, the peck bands aren't round, so you have to round them before you put them on. The bands that are being used in the shorebird banding projects are colored and placed in specific locations. Mine's for this year is meadow over flag green on the upper right leg with nothing on the lower right leg, nothing on the upper left leg, and then two colors on the lower left leg. And the two colors, the bottom color changes about every 15 days. So I have one color for July, two colors for August, and uh, one color for the beginning of September and for July it's yellow and then the upper color changes every three days so even though I don't put radio transmitters on all birds I can still tell within three days of when they were banded every bird captured is banded using this method and certain measurements are taken and recorded with a wing rule and we do a natural wing cord as opposed to flatten so we don't push down on the wing and that one will be at 140 millimeters. We take a measure from the tip of their beak here to the proximal end of their nares, which is the hole in their beak. So that one will be 27.5. Measured like that with a measure 34.2. After all the measurements are recorded and the bands are in place, the birds are carefully released. Let's, uh, let's stop for a second here. Semi-palmated sandpiper. He has a black, it's a single color, tube-like bill. Black legs, and again, little semi-palmations on his feet. It's very important that the shorebirds actually have these, uh, these prairie potholes as stopover sites, because they were, where they were once scattered all throughout the mid-continent and used for the sh as the shorebirds jumped from site to site. Now they have to go longer distances or, or rely more on managed wetlands in order to have suitable habitat to actually make their migratory journey because you can only go so long on, on uh, fat as a fuel supply before you have to stop and, and refuel, which is what these wetlands serve to do. Whoa, we just had ink coming outside of there. There's definitely a lot to a lot to learn about them and uh, shorebirds as well as as well as the passerines that are around and 
and if you have an interest in it, the, the birding community is growing uh, greatly every year. And you don't need to have a expensive equipment to get into it. Just a, a cheap pair of binoculars will get you started. And, and if you decide to pursue it after that, you can, you can go on and, and start buying more expensive things if, if that's what you decide you need. But it's a fun sport, and it's actually a, a pretty cheap sport. It doesn't, doesn't cost a whole lot to get a pair of binoculars and, and just walk through your woods. The Minnesota Walleye Trail has grown to be the largest walleye tournament series in the state of Minnesota. Teams made up of family members, best friends, and fishing partners take part in this fun-filled event. We're on the lake called Laquiparo. The Minnesota Walleye Trail Tournament is set to begin the next day, and we are out scouting the competition during the pre-fishing day. Laquiparo Lake, located in west central Minnesota, is the lake that speaks, a French translation of the Dakota Indian name. During the Friday pre-fishing, the teams are out looking for the hot spots that will lead them to the big fish needed to place high in this leg of the Minnesota Walleye Trail Tournament. The Minnesota Walleye Trail is a series of walleye tournaments. We hold one tournament a month during the summer, May, June, July, and August. And then we hold what we call a state championship in September. We have 75 teams, two-person teams, just you and your buddy. Anybody can go fish it. The top 30 teams at the end of the summer qualify for the state championship, which is a no-entry fee event. The two-person teams are scouting every possible location on the pre-fishing day, getting ready for the event that starts the next day. But not everyone is under pressure. There are a few anglers out enjoying a plain old nice day of fishing on Laquapara Lake. Tournament director Tom Miller talks about how the Minnesota Walleye Trail Tournament started. Back in 2002, we got involved with uh, fishing tournaments down in the Iowa Walleye Tournament Trail. And just went down there, had a lot of fun, kind of thought, you know, maybe we could do this back in Minnesota. We have been running the, uh, our local Conservation League's tournaments. We've been running that for like 14 years before that. So we kind of had some tournament experience. Looked at Minnesota, decided there was uh, nothing like it in Minnesota. There should be an opening for us to do that. So that's, I guess, how we got started. We went to Minnesota or started one in our own state. Saturday. The weather changes to rain, but the fish have been biting and the teams start to bring in their catch. We have uh, five tournaments throughout the course of the year. We have one tournament uh, each month beginning in May, so May, June, July, and August. We have a qualifier each one of those four months, and then we have, hold our championship in September. So there's a total of five tournaments. As the fish are weighed in, the crowd starts to gather. But that is a big right there. What do you think you weighed? Seven, maybe eight. That's what he's guessing. We'll see. 7.78 pounds. 7.78 pounds. You know what's how to guess it. I got it ready. You're holding up the show here. The teams, most, almost all of them are Minnesota. We do have teams from seven states. There's a, guy, there's a guy here from Chicago. He fishes last year with his brother, and he drives up every weekend from Chicago just to fish the Minnesota Walleye Trail. But most of them, by far, are from Minnesota. We've got uh, records for the largest fish so far was set on last year on Big Stone Lake is 7.69 pounds. It was set by Tony Renner and Mike Ingebrigtsen. They're out of the Hutchinson Broughton area. The largest single catch, single day catch, was set at our very first tournament down at Lake Benton. That was 26 pounds for six fish, so that was a real nice basket. 7.9, new big fish, new MWT record. New MWT record, new big fish for the day. Larry, we got to have a fish for this one. Big fish for the day. Every fish caught in this tournament will be released back into Laquapara Lake. The Laquapara tournament will be a catch and release tournament. Our uh, Minnewaska will be catch and release. Um, DNR doesn't allow any live release tournaments in the months of July and August. 
So those fish will be uh, either donated to an area rest home or the fishermen themselves will keep the fish. And then in uh, September, we'll be back to catch and release again. And we do average over 90% release rate on the walleyes that we catch. If you're thinking about fishing Minnesota walleye trout, I say do it early. We've, this is our fourth season. The first year we were 90% full. The last three years we have filled the Minnesota walleye trail in March. So if you want to do it, you do it early. Then they got four more uh, real nice eaters to go with it. So get in there early. We're the most popular one in Minnesota. 7.18. 7.18. About the fourth largest fish for the day, I think. Young fishermen gather to watch the weigh-in, as well as the experienced anglers of Lac Wapara, braving the cold, wet day. The Minnesota Walleye Trail, looking forward to another fun, action-packed season on the lakes of Minnesota. Let's take a look at some outdoor footage recorded by one of our viewers. Charles Hansen is a resident of rural Corral, Minnesota, and lends his knowledge in the following Prairie Sportsman viewer video. These birds are just close to the house that I live in on Artichoke Lake, and I'm taking these pictures from the upstairs window of the, of the house, close to some of the boxes that I've put out. Wood ducks become a very uh, popular bird to uh, observe and uh, to maintain their numbers as people have taken a great interest in the welfare of these birds in recent years and have built hundreds of thousands of wood duck nesting boxes to um, help these birds out with their nesting activity. They're cavity nesters. They, they do not tend to nest on the ground, so they, they look for um, crevices and holes and trees, but there are never enough of these natural places to accommodate the number of birds that are looking for suitable nesting sites, so the placement of these nesting boxes has greatly increased the numbers of these birds. Wood ducks were once classed as a vanishing species. Around the turn of the century, they thought that uh, they may become, would become extinct. But uh, a closed season for many years uh, helped their numbers greatly, and a restricted uh, season since then has helped to maintain and their numbers. And of course, with the interest that people have taken in building nesting boxes, uh, their numbers have come back and to the numbers that we see today. One of the competitors for um, wood duck nesting boxes and so nesting sites is the hooded merganser in this area. Further north, the golden eye and the bufflehead also tend to nest in man-made boxes and structures. The most uh, young wood ducks that I have ever seen come out of a box at a, hat, at a given hatch is 27. Uh, this was not, obviously not the clutch of one bird, but what would be considered a multiple usage nest, where more than one hen has laid eggs in the same box, but one bird took the entire clutch of, out of the box during the hatching. Wood ducks have found over the eastern part of the United States and have now extended their range much further west than they originally had. There is a west coast population of wood ducks that extends from northern California, Oregon, Washington, up into north or southern British Columbia. And then there's a stretch in between that they're not found. But then again, you get out into uh, the Black Hills of South Dakota, sometimes even further west, and then they be begin to be noticed again. And their popularity is uh, increasingly more numerous as we come east, and it's now considered the most numerous nesting duck east of the Mississippi River. Wood ducks tend to leave us quite early in the fall, head south, most of the birds wintering in Arkansas, Louisiana, and other states to the south. The only close relative of the wood duck in the world is the mandarin, which is an Asiatic species the female wood duck and the female mandarin duck are almost identical, but the drakes are differently patterned. 
most people would say without any, any doubt that the wood duck is the most beautiful duck in the world. Here you can see a more than just a, an ordinary skirmish. This wood, one wood duck has got the other one by the neck, and they're, they're in a serious fight. They then went, then went down to the ground and are tumbling and skirmishing down on the ground. Do you have a photo you'd like to share? We'd like to see it. Send us a digital picture by email or an outdoor photo by mail to this address. We'd like to include your photo in our show. Your photos will be returned. Now let's go to Chef Kurt Anderson. He's always got something cooking. Hey, sportsmen. We're ready to make jerky. Got a piece of deer meat down here. Now jerky, they always say you should use a very lean cut of meat. What I want to show you today is I'm going to try to remove some of the cartilage that would have been right near the bone structure, right next to the rib cage here. You can see that I've got some uh, fat and I'm going to have some muscle in here that I'm going to want to get rid of. Okay, now this piece of meat here maybe isn't good for jerky, but if we're careful and we run our knife underneath it, we could perhaps take out that silver skin and that muscling, and we could use that meat for stir fry along with other products as well. One of the ways is just leave, let the blade of your knife do the work and pull the fat away. We'll just hold that to the side. But now we've got our lean piece of meat, and I want to show you how to cut this. We're going to cut this very thin. Usually when you make jerky, they suggest that you don't cut it thicker than a quarter inch if you can all, at all help it, okay? And we're going to try to go across the grain. I know that isn't always possible on certain cuts. Therefore, there's another rule of jerky. Try to keep the cuts short, between five to six inches in length and no more than an inch or two wide. Now, that jerky can be done in a couple of different matters. Uh, here's a couple of examples. I've taken some basic sauces that we would have at home, and the examples I've used, you guys have taco sauce at the house. Empty a bottle of taco sauce into your uh, container, slice your meat, and put your meat right in the taco sauce. I added a little bit of salad oil so the taco sauce is a little runnier. To make good jerky by using a marinade, it's important that you've got a good flavor and that you've also got some type of acid to help in the cooking of that meat. Now we're gonna put this in the oven and dry it, and at that point it's gotta dry about six to eight hours at a temperature between 150 and 200 degrees with the oven door slightly open. If you're lucky enough and have a food dehydrator, it too will take six hours of drying time. Now here's a larger chunk, which I just wanna show you. When you marinate the meat overnight, you can see how that meat had already started to cook in, excuse me, how the marinade had started to cook in, and you can see that it changed color just slightly, about a quarter inch all the way around the meat. This is saying or telling us that the flavor has worked its way into the meat. This is now gonna possess that flavor once I slice it and dry it. Now, I wanna show you a jerky that you can make without having to marinate it couple of easy steps. You're going to need a seasoning that you really enjoy at home. This happens to be one of my favorites. It's just a hot spicy barbecue seasoning. And then we're going to take some non-stick food spray. We've sliced our meat. You can see that we're only about a quarter inch thick. And we're going to top this meat with this food spray. Now this is especially good for people that have to watch the amount of oils they maybe are taking in. Now, we'll flip that over, because we're just gonna spice this up real well, because remember, this is how to do all the work for us. When we dry it and we eat it, this is the flavor we wanna taste. So there's a multitude of flavors you could use. If you're just a salt and pepper kind of person, if you're a Worcestershire type of person, if you're a chopped fennel seed, that'll work as well. Now, I've taken this meat if I put it in the oven and dry it for six to eight hours, I'm gonna end up with a product that looks like this. This is the dry jerky I made. This is the marinated jerky I made. 
Okay? Now let me show you what happens with the finished product. We did this one without a marinade. We could also have used a salad oil instead of the spray if necessary. Just season real well. Once it was dried, this is the product we ended up with. Now, to get it a little more golden in color, we could have added some sugar to the top of these. The sugar would have caramelized it a little bit more so. But this one's going to be hot and spicy. Now you see a bit of a sheen to this. So the rule with jerky, if the jerky is damp, it'll last about a week in the fridge. You could put it in a baggie, it'll work well for you. If it's very dry, it'll last much longer. Also, if you've got one of those vacuum packing machines, you'll also be able to increase the life of your jerky much longer as well. This jerky over here was the ones that were marinated. You can see by the, the look of this plate, our crew liked this one a lot better. This jerky here too, I've let it dry overnight in an oven. I like my jerky not overly crisp. So because of that, I've cut this a quarter inch thick like we had done here. If you can slice it thinner, you're gonna get a crisper jerky. Good luck on your jerky making. When it comes to jig fishing, I like to use an open face spinning reel just like this as well. I'll match that up with either a six foot to a six foot eight extra fast action rod. Another good thing to consider when you're looking at a good spinning reel for jig fishing is to make sure that it has infinite and a reverse. An infinite and a reverse means as you actually reel, it stops right there so that when you get a bite, you can immediately set the hook. Another thing I look for are the number of ball bearings. In general, the more ball bearings that a reel has, the smoother the reel actually is. But purchase what you can afford. Well, that's our show for this week, folks. Come on back next week for another episode of Prairie Sportsman. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, designed for you for any season. Whether you're there for business pleasure or just plain relaxing, there's something for everyone. The Arrowwood, located on beautiful Lake Darling, just outside of Alexandria, Minnesota. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station.